Now to the latest on the coronavirus's devastating toll on the U.S. The country is now seeing its highest monthly case total, and there is still one week left in November. According to John Hopkins University, more than 3 million new cases were reported between the 1st and the 22nd. That's more than a quarter of all cases in the country. But there is new hope on the vaccine front. AstraZeneca announced late-stage trials of its coronavirus vaccine. It shows it is up to 90% effective, depending on the dosage. Charlie Daggett reports. Large-scale trials showed the vaccine prevented more than 70% of people from getting COVID. That number jumps up to 90% if half the dose is used, followed by a booster shot of a full dose. Data shows it works across all age groups, and it's safe. Mild side effects include headache, fatigue, and a sore arm. Volunteers were also swabbed on a weekly basis to see if it showed a reduction in asymptomatic cases when people spread the virus without knowing they had it. The reason we did all of those swabs was to ask the question, could a vaccine prevent transmission as well as disease? And this is one way of doing that. I think it's the first vaccine to report on that endpoint. The U.S. Warp Speed program has pumped more than a billion dollars into the development of the Oxford vaccine in return for an initial rollout of 300 million doses. The vaccines only need basic refrigeration rather than deep freeze temperatures. That makes distribution easier and faster. Upscaling the manufacture of the vaccine is also easier, and AstraZeneca have pledged to make 3 billion doses in 2021. So the big question, when are we going to see this vaccine in the United States? Well, AstraZeneca say that they're in conversations with the FDA. But they said it's possible that this vaccine may be rolled out to other countries before it reaches America. Emery and Vlad. Charlie, thank you. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Ron Elfenbein. He's the medical director and owner of First Call Medical Center. So, doctor, one key difference between AstraZeneca's vaccine and others is that the AstraZeneca vi uh, vaccine shows a reduction in asymptomatic cases. What kind of impact could that have moving forward? Yeah, so the uh, other vaccines that we talked about, the Moderna vaccine and the um, uh, Pfizer vaccine, Pfizer just applied for their emergency use authorization on Friday. Uh, those two vaccines um, may not reduce the uh, carrier rate, meaning that people can still catch the virus, um, but they're not going to get sick from it. They're not going to be hospitalized. They're not going to get badly sick. Uh, whereas this this vaccine um, looks like the, the, the data showing that it will actually pr provide some degree of protection, if you will, against actually catching the virus and becoming a spreader. So uh, that will help tremendously with achieving herd immunity and achieving, um, you know, keeping people from getting sick. So, I, again, I, I think these are all good, good quality, good, you know, things to look forward to and good things that light, light at the end of the tunnel kind of stuff. Um, and it's great that they're reporting all this. The question, is, as your reporter just raised, is when are they going to apply for their emergency use authorization with the FDA? And when are they going to make this vaccine available? So when I first started hearing about the vaccine, I sort of Googled, I saw two different numbers, 70 percent efficacy for the vaccine. But then that number jumps to like 90 percent when you change the dosage. Can you explain to us the difference in the dosing regimens uh, being looked into um, when it comes to this trial? So, yeah, so, so the two, two, two doses, uh, you know, obviously one of the things that they look at when they're deciding on how to dose a vaccine and how often to give it and things like that, it's not just sort of random. They, they have to figure this stuff out and they look at, well, which is the most efficacious dose? Is it, you know, X or is it Y? And they kind of have to play with it and determine which one is better. And the only way to do that is through trial and error. So in this case, it was two different arms of the study and they looked at it and saying, okay, well, dose X is, well, let's see how that one does versus dose Y. And in this case, obviously one was way more efficacious than the other. But remember all these efficacies that we're looking at 95, 90, 70, all these different vaccines, this is only preliminary data and it's only data that is supplied by the manufacturer. And it's very, very limited in scope. So it hasn't been peer reviewed and it hasn't been given the scientific scrutiny that it really needs to be given. Uh, not to say that it's not good. This is great news. This is great stuff. But everybody's just got to take this with a grain of salt and that more data will come out as time goes on um, and that this is only the data that we're getting from the manufacturers. So, you know, we're going to need a little bit more time to, to really digest this stuff and to have it all looked at 
in, in peer-reviewed journals so that we can actually, you know, really, really tear it apart, the data, I mean, and, and determine, okay, how, how efficacious really is this vaccine? Because we don't really know at this point. Um, and again, you're, you're talking about relatively small numbers th that they're making these, these claims on. So as the numbers grow, the efficacy will become, the, the data that we get for the efficacy will become way more uh, reliable. Dr. Alphabon, I'm sure you know, over the weekend, the FDA granted emergency use authorization for Regeneron's COVID-19 antibody treatment. Yeah. That was the same drug that was given to President Trump. Now, as I understand it, it's aimed at preventing hospitalization and worsening symptoms in patients with mild to moderate cases of COVID-19. But there are concerns that the treatment may be in short supply. Uh, so what more can you tell us about this treatment and why its availability may be limited? Yes, Vlad. So it's it's a it's called a monoclonal antibody. It actually comes from hamster cells, uh, which is really interesting. And um, they it's 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 fascinating actually. It's an antibody. It's a, a white blood cell that produces antibodies to the virus. It's actually two different antibodies in the in Regeneron. They're called monoclonal antibodies. So it's a, a, a antibody basically against one protein in particular. And there's two of them in this particular drug called Regeneron that you're talking about. And what the problem with it is, is it's manufactured from living cells. So it takes a lot of time. It's not something you can rush. It's not something you can kind of, you know, put pressure on to make it work faster. It is what it is, and it takes as long as it takes to manufacture it. So uh, according to Regeneron, they're going to have 80,000 doses by the end of November, and they're going to have 300,000 doses by the end of January. Obviously, that's pretty slow, and that's not, uh, not going to help a tremendous amount of people. So they're looking at other companies to help manufacture it by giving them the quote unquote secret sauce to how to do it and giving them the cocktail and the actual uh, cells to, to clone to make these monoclonal antibodies. So, you know, it, it's limited in scope in terms of how many people that can it can help. But uh, it, as you said, it's it's been shown in people 12 years old and older to be effective in keeping them out of the hospital. So it's not effective for people who are being hospitalized. If you're bad enough to have to be in the hospital, you cannot get this drug. It is not indicated for you. Only for people who are out of the hospital and who have the potential to get really bad. So they have things like hypertension, chronic lung disease, diabetes, the risk factors that we know about that would put them in a high risk category. Those people would be eligible for this drug. The other problem with this drug is it has to be given intravenously. So it's not something that your doctor can prescribe for you and you can go pick it up at the pharmacy. You have to go to an infusion center that will willing to take COVID-19 patients those are few and far between as well. So, you know, it's it's kind of hard to to get out to the general public, if you will. Um, plus, this very limited supply. So, it, it again, it makes it somewhat difficult to get your hands on. Mm hmm. So. It is the Thanksgiving Thanksgiving week, I guess. Despite the warnings from public health officials, we're seeing millions of people traveling for the holiday. TSA numbers showed Friday was the second busiest day at security checkpoints since the pandemic began. That's not even counting the people that are driving and not flying. Is there a way to safely travel this holiday season? Yeah, stay home. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yeah. unfortunately, I mean, obviously, I'm, that's tongue in cheek. I mean, I, I, you know, the CDC, the FDA, the every level of government uh, from states to counties to uh, municipalities to, to the federal government is all advising people not to travel. So the idea is if you can, don't travel. Uh, if you're going to travel, obviously, you know, wear, wear your mask, uh, wash your hands, uh, avoid loud, large crowds. Um, you know, just be extra, extra careful. If you can get tested before you travel, even better. If you, you know, quarantine before traveling, quarantine after traveling, um, you know, stay within your bubble. If you're going to travel to visit grandma, ideally, you know, you're going to still follow the same quarantine procedures at, at her house or his house or whoever your family member you're going to see is. In other words, don't sit at the same table. Don't, don't share the same food. It's okay to be in the same room. Ideally, you wouldn't be, but if you're going to be you know, wear a mask, but sit, sit at least six feet apart from everybody else. Um, you, you just want to be smart about it to minimize your risk. Of course, by, by traveling, you're, you're, you're taking on risk. So you really want to mitigate that risk as much as possible. So do all the things we keep talking about. Uh, again, number one being wear a mask, wash your hands, stay six feet apart. Uh, if you can eat outside, even better. If you can, you know, sit at a little table on the, the patio and everybody sits six feet apart even better. Uh, just do whatever you can do to kind of keep yourself as safe as possible. But ideally, and I know it's terrible and I know it's, you know, it's Thanksgiving, everyone wants to be together, but if, if you can do it, just do, 
don't travel. I mean, you, you know, people have been apart long already for months and months. Another couple of weeks is not not going to not going to kill people. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news and I hate to say that. But, you know, you want to be safe and you want to you know, want to be OK. Again, not trying to scare right. people, not trying to make this a doom and gloom thing, but just, you know, we know the numbers are skyrocketing everywhere and it's it's not looking like it's going to get better anytime soon. So please just be careful and be smart. Yeah, another couple of weeks, you said, isn't going to kill you. Uh, not, you know, waiting a couple of weeks actually could sort of. I mean, we we spend a lot of time talking about super spreader events. But, Doctor, what we're seeing more and more is it's these small gatherings, these birthday yes. parties, these smaller scaled back weddings. This is where we're seeing uh, people contracting the virus. And sometimes they have masks. Sometimes they try to get tests before they gather. It's not making a difference. The best thing to do is to travel virtually uh, if you can. Um, so, Dr. Ron, thank you so much. It's always good having you here. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Dr. Ron. Same to you.